So uh, let me uh, welcome everyone to the second day of this 50, 51st uh, MMF annual conference. I can say that we're really in for a treat today. We've got two of the best people in the world, I think, to be here uh, uh, introducing and then discussing the question of uh, uncertainty and reallocation in the wake of COVID-19. So we're going to uh, begin with with um, uh, with uh, Stephen Davis, uh, the, the William H. Abbott Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago's Booth Business School. And Steve is a pioneer with John Halterwanger in the analysis of firm dynamics. So he then more recently has been pioneering another empirical revolution in uh, the measurement of uncertainty with Nick Bloom and, and co-authors. In the pandemic, he's brought these two things together in the very un unusual uh, circumstances in which we all find ourselves. And he's going to be exploring that today in his talk. Um, after he's uh, talked for uh, 45 minutes or so, then uh, Peter Sedlicek is going to uh, be the discussant. And as I kind of hinted, you know, yet, it, yet it, once again, we're going to have someone who's really at the very forefront of uh, research in reallocation. And Pete, Peter's recent work has been on startups in, and in fact, the lack of them in the pandemic. And you can go, go onto his website and play with a very nice um, online startup calculator. And this is work that he's been doing with my uh, colleague, Vincent Sturck at UCL. Um, so that also, I think, will help bring a European perspective to uh, the presentation that uh, Steve is going to make. So that's kind of uh, setting the scene. In terms of the logistics of, uh, of, of the session, it will work the same way as, uh, as was the case yesterday. So that all the questions are going to be uh, uh, presented uh, by you. So you have to go to slido.com. Mm. And here you go. So check in, do it now. It's, it's a good idea to find slido.com on, on your browser. The event code 51008. And the way it works is that when something comes into your mind as uh, Steve and Peter are giving, giving their um, talks and comments and responses and so on, just submit your question. And then Amit uh, Kara is going to be our question handler. And so at the end, he'll, he'll come back and uh, do some kind of very clever ordering of the questions um, and, and help with the flow of the discussion. But you know, don't hesitate to put your questions in. You can always you know, put in another question later on, or a better question, if you think of a better question. Amit will do the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the sorting out of them. So uh, it, it will be great mm. to see people start getting some questions in, into Slido early on. So I'm going to hand over to Steve, and he'll then uh, share his screen. So just, again, Slido, and the number is 51008. OK, over to you, Steve. Thank you, Wendy. That was a great setup. Um, let me bring up my slides and uh, and are they visible? Perfect. Great. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, Wendy suggested uh, I'm going to present uh, you with several pieces of empirical evidence, broadly speaking, under the heading of uncertainty and reallocation. Um, I will tie some of the strands together, not all of them. I'll also make some links to uh, Jan's great talk yesterday. Now, um, let me start out with some observations about uncertainty. And I'm presuming most people saw Jan's talk. So I'm mainly going to try to add um, some observations to what she said. Uh, the first one she talked about is the, uh, historic, the, high, the high, high levels of uncertainty. And as she mentioned, you see that in um, across the board of uncertainty measures. Uh, what I want to do on this slide is focus on one measure, realized stock market volatility, um, for which we can construct a very long time series. So in recent years, 
realize stock volatility. Um, this is uh, daily squared daily changes um, of monthly stock uh, closing prices on stock market, U.S. stock stock prices, um, and then um, squaring that, summing it here over the past two weeks. This behaves fairly similarly to the implied volatility measure that uh, Jan showed yesterday and when it overlaps. But here we've gone all the way back to 1900. And the first point I wanna leave you with is that the pandemic volatility episode is one of the great volatility episodes in US stock markets in the last 120 years, okay? The second point I wanna leave you with is the suddenness with which uncertainty rose. You see that on the um, bottom half of this chart uh, you also see it across the board in a variety of other uncertainty measures that we can construct at, say, a weekly frequency or even, in some cases, a daily frequency. So here's a variety of measures for the U.S. and the U.K. Um, there's two VIX-like measures uh, at the one-month horizon and the 24-month horizon. Uh, you saw a fair bit of attention to those yesterday. Um, there's the Economic Policy Uncertainty Index, newspaper-based uh, for the United States. Uh, there's a subjective uncertainty about sales growth rate from the uh, decision maker panel in the US, uh, in the UK rather. And there's a liquor-like measure which uh, for the UK that I won't explain. What you see here is that there was just a tremendous upsurge really within the space of a few weeks in March. Um, and there's been some fallback, especially for the financially oriented measures, much less so for the measures that uh, focus on the real side of the economy. And you see a similar pattern in other measures that aren't available at such a high frequency. So first two points is that I'm, that I'm, I'm basically gonna paint a picture here of how unusual this volatility episode uh, has been. Point one is it's one of the great volatility episodes in the past 120 years. Point two is how rapidly it came upon us. Um, point three is the uh, extraordinary role of the pandemic. I mean that in two senses. The first one is no surprise. The pandemic's a huge episode. Uh, not surprisingly, it has figured very prominently um, in stock market volatility. And the way I'm making that point here, and that's the bottom row of this chart, this is based on a multi-year project with Nick Bloom, Scott Baker, and Marco Salmon, in which we are systematically, we have engaged in a systematic human readings of next day newspaper accounts about big stock market moves. And big here is defined as the market moved up or down um, by at least two and a half percent from the close of the previous day to the close of the current day. That gets you on average maybe eight or nine jumps per year, just to put things in context, okay? Um, in the period from 24 March to 30 April, okay, which is when the pandemic really um, began having a major impact on equity markets in the United States and, 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 more, and globally, it's almost all about the pandemic, okay? Again, that, that part's not a surprise. The thing that is, I think, noteworthy here is there is no previous episode in the United States back to 1900 where newspapers ever attributed a major daily stock market move to a pandemic, infectious disease, or related developments. That includes the Spanish flu of 1918, 1920, okay? So this pandemic has been extraordinary, not just on its impact on the economy, but also how it's moved financial markets. And then, Wrapped up there is a third point, which let me make it explicit. The, the impact of the pandemic on the stock market and the economy relative to its mortality impact is completely unprecedented. And I'll, I'll make that point in two ways. First, the mortality rate to date in the United States from COVID-19 is about the same as the mortality rates the US experienced in the 1957-58 influenza pandemic and the 1968 influenza pandemic. It's actually in between those two, which are, they're not that far apart. So just think about that. Most of us have never heard of, unless we were living through it, 
the 57, 58, or 1968 influenza pandemics in the United States. Um, the 19, it's, if you look really hard, maybe you can find some impact on the macroeconomy of the 57, 58 influenza pandemic. 68 imp influenza pandemic just doesn't show up in any macro statistics that I'm aware of. So there's this outsized impact on the economy and the financial markets relative to uh, mortality. Same thing with respect to the Spanish flu, which did have an impact on the economy, but the mortality impact of the Spanish flu was a, an order of magnitude greater than the mortality impact to date of um, COVID-19. So that's another sense in which um, this is an unusual uh, pandemic. Now, one more sense, and it's partly captured by this um, table, but let me give you another point. The flow rate of these big daily stock market moves, as I defined it earlier, market moving up or down at least two and a half percent, was greater in March 2020 than any other calendar month in the United States back to 1900. And what I, that's just, that's not, they're not all about COVID, although the vast majority are. That's just a reflection of the tremendous uh, flow of new information that is affecting equity markets in the United States. And I'm not gonna talk about it, but really around the world um, uh, since, since basically late February. Now I wanna make one more, I wanna make the point about how extraordinary the pandemic's impact is on stock markets in a different way. Um, also using newspaper text, but now in an automated way rather than um, based on intensive human readings. So there's two parts to this um, um, fact I'm gonna show you here. First in other work with you know, Nick, Nick Bloom, Scott Baker and a, another grad student, Kyle Coast, um, we've constructed a newspaper-based newspaper tracker of equity market volatility. Um, I won't go into the details. It's roughly in the spirit of what we've done with our policy uncertainty measures, although there are some differences in the details, um, mostly because we have an observable counterpart to equity market volatility, which is the VIX or a realized volatility measure. So what this chart does is show you that we can construct in using fairly simple measures and methods, a high quality newspaper based tracker of stock market volatility here is measured by the VIX. And you might say, okay, what, so what? We've got the VIX, what do we need a newspaper based tracker for? Because once we have a newspaper based tracker, we can parse the text in the newspaper articles that enter into the tracker, okay? And let me show you what we do. And we do that in many ways. We can quantify the, the apparent role of monetary policy, fiscal policy, wars, all kinds of things. You know, maybe we've divided this into about 50 categories. But here's what we get when we take our equity market volatility tracker and we use it to construct an, an infectious disease focused equity market volatility tracker, okay? And the message here, there's two messages here. First, uh, since, uh, since March or since late February, equity market volatility is all about the pandemic in the sense that the vast majority of the articles about stock market volatility in this period uh, discuss the pandemic and its economic fallout and policy responses to it. The second point to take away from this chart, and here we go back to 1985, is previous well-known pandemics had minuscule effects on equity markets, okay? So I'm basically laying out the case, not just how big this um, volatility and uncertainty episode is, but how unusual it is in the role that a pandemic has played. There is, at least in the United States, there is no precedent for some infectious disease episode to have that kind of impact on financial markets, nor is there a precedent for it to have that for such a big impact on the real side of the economy relative to its mortality impact. Now, one, one more point about uncertainty. Um, this is kind of the rainbow effect. Uh, the, and here this, here this is from the survey of business uncertainty, uh, we, w which is the uh, kind of US analog to the decision, decision maker panel uh, in the UK. Um, in April and in August, we asked firms when they expect um, coronavirus related uncertainty facing their own firm to be largely resolved. 
Okay, those two survey dates are about four months apart. Within that four month span, the horizon over kind of the modal, the modal horizon at which businesses expect the pandemic uncertainty to be resolved, basically receded by at least four months, maybe six months. Okay, so this is like you're trying to chase the rainbow and as you chase it, it gets farther away. That's, that's the nature of how perceived uncertainty has evolved uh, in recent months. And that's a, that's a very different evolution of uncertainty than the kind that we normally would feed into uh, a simple uh, model designed to uh, highlight, say, a real options effect. Now, Jan pointed out yesterday that this uh, big uncertainty shock has also come with a um, uh, negative first moment shock. And uh, that is a typical characteristic of uh, high uncertainty episodes. But there's something else that goes on, that's gone on in this episode um, that is going to occupy my attention for most of the rest of the shock, shock and talk. And I'll start by, I'll make the transition by again, working with stock market data. Um, and so what you see is that not only has there been this big negative shock, um, big spike in uncertainty, but there's been tremendous firm level dispersion in the impact or in the reactions to these shocks. And I will start out with um, evidence from the equity market very briefly, just because we've got high frequency data there. And then I'll move to other more, other more labor market oriented measures. So there's an emerging body of literature on this. So I'm gonna show you one chart each from two papers, but there's quite a bit of interesting work which I'm engaged in on this front. The first, this is just showing the cross-sectional dispersion of monthly equity returns among US listed firms. And here I'm computing returns as the um, log change in the price um, adjusted for stock dividends and that kind of thing from the last day of one trading month to the last day of the next trading month. And then for each one of those one month intervals, I'm taking the cross-sectional dispersion. Here is measured by the interquartile range of equity returns. Standard deviation gives you a similar uh, um, picture. And um, everything here is done on a valuated basis. And so what you see back, back to 1985, the last spike you see on this chart is the, is the kind of pandemic spike. And if you focus on the period, the kind of one month period that follows on the eruption uh, from the eruption of the pandemic in its impact on equity markets in the United States, you get this dot that's highlighted in red. So, the reason I start with this chart is because it's got a reasonably long horizon. And you can see that in terms of dispersion now, not uncertainty, but in terms of dispersion of impact on equity prices, uh, this episode also looks unusual. Now, <clears throat> here's another chart. This looks a bit complicated, but it's, uh, I think it's a quite a cool chart. Let me tell you what, what we see here. This is using daily um, equity returns. Um, the gray dots are are every trading day in 2019. On the horizontal scale, you just see the average valuated equity return uh, for a given day. And on the vertical scale is a measure of dispersion or spread in firm level returns. And here again, I've used the interquartile range of equity returns across firms. Um, everything here again is done in a valuated sense. Um, and then the colored dots are all the big stock market jumps, uh, basically from late February to uh, I think the end of March uh, in 2020, of which there are many, as I mentioned before. Uh, what I want you to notice uh, is a few things about the scale on this. The scale on the left-hand side is, um, these are daily percent differentials, not annualized. Okay, so that March 16th dot there says that the interquartile range among firms on a valuated basis on March 16th was seven percentage points. That's simply an enormous dispersion. Okay, and you can see what this chart shows you is when the market moved a lot on the whole, there was a big dispersion. And just to give you an idea, to put this in context, I've isolated, I've highlighted this point March 18th. That the 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 IQR on that date <clears throat> is 15 standard deviations greater than the average IQR in 2019. Again, measuring the standard deviation in <clears throat> 2019 units. So the picture you should have on your mind is lots of uncertainty, but it's not like there's been some 10% decline for the average firm and a mean preserving spread around that. <clears throat> Instead, some firms are very, very favorably affected 
by the pandemic and others are hugely negatively affected by the pandemic. And I think that's an important point that we want to keep in mind when we think about the impact of the pandemic and particularly the impact of the uncertainty. Um, for some firms, the uncertainty is almost all to the upside, like Zoom. Uh, for other firms, the uncertainty is almost all to the downside. Uh, and that's, a, that's an important feature of this pandemic. Now, <clears throat> let me move more directly into um, the, um, the reallocation shocks of the uh, uh, aspects of the uh, pandemic. And I moved out of uh, uh, display mode for a second so I could check my time. So I'm going to show you uh, several facts about um, the reallocative nature of the pandemic. And I'm going to turn my focus more uh, to the labor market now. Let me start with a fact that I'll just tell you, but won't show you the evidence of. It's documented in my uh, paper with uh, Jose Maria Barrero and Nick Bloom uh, that's forthcoming in the Brookings paper. And that is, <clears throat> even in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic in March and April and May in the United States, there were a lot of firms hiring, OK? Um, there was reallocation going on from con contemporaneously from shrinking firms to growing firms. There are lots of news stories about both. On the on kind of the plus side, there are companies like Amazon, Walmart, CVS Healthcare. These companies were all hiring um, 100,000 or 200,000 plus workers within the space of a few weeks. Lowe's Healthcare, Domino's Pizza. There's lots of anecdotal evidence of that. And what we do in the... <clears throat> In this paper I reference is we provide some systematic evidence as well. If you kind of want to summarize it, and maybe the easiest way to think about it is if you go to the JOLTS data in the United States, the Job Opening and Labor Turnover Survey, you see a huge number of layoffs in March and April, um, just millions and millions. For every, for every 10 layoffs you see in the JOLTS data, there were four new hires, okay? Obviously, Four is a lot less than 10, but the point is four is still a lot, especially when there's so much layoffs going on. So there are lots of hiring even in the midst of the pandemic. That's point one. Uh, point two, which I'm gonna dwell on at some length, um, is, is many of these layoffs that happened uh, in March, uh, April, and, and May. Uh, there's good reasons to think, and there's mounting evidence that many of them will um, be permanent in the sense that the job losing worker won't go back to his, his um, old job at his former employer. And let me, let me develop that point because I, I think that point was in the data as far back as um, April. Um, and we started, I guess, pounding the, the deck about this point back in early May. Um, I think initially in the face of considerable resistance, although maybe less so now. So one of the things we did with the survey of business uncertainties, we we asked firms in April um, about their layoffs, hires, and expected layoffs and hires um, since March 1, so it's from March 1 to mid-April, but also through the mid-May, so that we could get a forward-looking sense of how many layoffs were happening, how many hires, um, and also how many of the layoffs they thought were temporary and how many they thought were permanent. So in that survey, they told us they thought 23% of the layoffs were uh, permanent at the time. Um, a little bit later, a Washington Post survey came out of households, same 23% number. Quite a bit later, um, a very high quality number came out from the California Policy Lab based on claimants, what claimants for unemployment benefits say. So this is administrative record data, much larger samples. They also got about a 23% number. So I think that 23% number of what people, businesses and workers thought at the time the layoff happened is a pretty hard number. Now, if you look historically though, many layoffs that are perceived as temporary when they happen do not actually result in recalls. You know, things don't work out as well for the business as they had hoped or expected. And so some workers don't get laid off. If you take the historical recall rates as a function of perceived layoff status at the time of the layoff, and you apply that to these 23% numbers and also to the per permanent layoffs I'm, that go back, I'm not ignoring that. What you find is that, um, and this is the projection we made, one third or more of those tens of millions of layoffs that happened in March, April, and May, one third or more of those would result in permanent job loss uh, in the sense that I described earlier. Um, so what's actually happened, that's, that's, that's quite a sobering fact. And, um, 
its implications for policymakers, I think, is, is first order. It means we shouldn't think of that we were ever going to go back to uh, the status quo ante. In my view, that was never in the cards. Uh, and certainly not in the cards, given how long the pandemic has lingered. And what I mean by that is many of these workers need to find new jobs. Now, what's actually happened um, in the meantime? Um, well, if you go, if you kind of take a naive approach to this question, you say, you know, it's not really that bad in terms of permanent layoffs. And here, if you go to the current population survey in the United States and you just take the face value count of persons who say they're unemployed by CPS criteria and are on permanent layoff, what you see is an increase of 1.1 million from February to July. That's bad, but it looked nearly as bad as the great financial crisis, the global financial crisis, where it was you know, four times that large. So it doesn't look so bad, but that is a very misleading uh, way to read the data. And let me tell you why. There's more, more than one reason. First, and probably the biggest reason, there were, there were 6 million people who transitioned from employment to out of the labor force or inactivity, I guess as you call it in British English, uh, in April and May. Nothing like that happened in the, in the great financial crisis, as you can see on the left-hand side of this chart. So there was a huge spike of people who left the labor force. The vast majority of these were permanently laid off people. Um, why, how do I know they weren't temporarily laid off? Because by CPS criteria, if you're temporarily laid off, you get counted in the unemployment pool, whether you're looking for a job or not. You don't get counted as out of the labor force. Okay, some additional evidence, which I don't show on this chart, you can see there's a, there's a huge increase in the flow of re-entrance to the unemployment pool from out of the labor force in April uh, and in June and July, which is consistent with my interpretation of this picture. Also, CPS, interviewer guidance since March has, in my view, led to an understatement of permanent layoffs. And there's some gory details there. If you want to see the argument, look in the appendix to this paper with uh, Jose Maria Barrero and Nick Bloom. Now, <clears throat> so that what I've shown you so far tells me that of those huge numbers of layoffs we had in March to, to May, many of them are will turn out to be permanent. On top of that, there's been a continuing high flow rate of new claims for unemployment benefits um, that are running about four to six times since early June, four to six times pre-pandemic pre level. And then one more, one more observation, um, going back to the California Policy Lab data, you can actually trace at a weekly frequency the fraction of new claimants for unemployment benefits who say they expect to be recalled. In the immediate wake of the you know, kind of in, in mid and late March, 90% of them had that expectation. By late July, it's down to 60%. So all of this boils down to my bottom line here. There are, and it's I don't have a precise number. My, my educated guess is there are more than 10 million American workers who experienced a permanent job loss since March. And these permanent job losses are continuing at a much higher than normal pace after the pandemic. So from a labor market perspective, it's not just about getting workers to go back to their old jobs. There are many, many workers that aren't going back to their old jobs and we need to think about that in policy. Now, another piece of evidence, which is builds on what I said about um, permanent layoffs, but is also of independent interest. In the survey of business uncertainty, in the decision maker panel, we routinely ask businesses to make uh, subjective forecast distribution predictions um, about their sales and employment outlook outcomes at a one-year horizon. You can take those and construct uncertainty measures, which I, sh I showed you a version of that earlier for the UK. Jan also showed you some versions of that. She said she likes this measure because it's kind of close to a cash flow measure. But instead of using that micro data to construct uncertainty measures, you can also use it to construct a forward-looking expected excess reallocation rate and here, I won't go into the details, but basically the mechanics of this, they are, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna construct a forward looking analog to the kinds of excess job reallocation measures that Haltewanger and I and, and, and many others uh, have examined first in the labor market, but then eventually in many other settings. So the, 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 the arithmetic of this is, is basically the same. Um, and I'm, I'm building on that, but now doing it in a forward looking sense. This is the expected excess reallocation rate for sales revenue that comes out of the survey of business uncertainty 
uh, in the United States. This is a monthly measure, a monthly survey, but each month we ask about a one-year forecast horizon. So these are 12-month forecast horizons. The, the message of this picture is pretty clear. Um, since the survey first kind of started in September 2016, this bounced around in a rather small range. And then there was this big spike uh, starting in March um, in the uncertainty that firms, that, not the uncertainty, I apologize, in what firms, if you aggregate up their, their uh, point in their mean forecast, if you aggregate up what it means for reallocation, we should expect lots of reallocation to come. And of course, there's both the upside to reallocation and there's the downside, which is more permanent job losses. Now, I've given you a lot of bad news so far, so I wanna give you some good news. Um, so here's the good news. Jobs are, jobs are, in my view, much more plentiful than the unemployment numbers uh, in the United States uh, suggest. I'm gonna make that point in a couple of ways. First, starting by the, uh, with the job vacancy rate. Uh, many economists and newspapers articles have noted that the job vacancy rate fell um, quite sharply in the wake of the pandemic. And the most recent data for June um, are 3.7% uh, of employment, um, or, or actually it's uh, employment plus unemployment. I've used that as the denominator here. Um, that, that's a big drop. But then you got, if you put it in a larger context, it's not very bad. When was the last time we had a 3.7% vacancy rate in the United States? It was back in May, 2017. What was the unemployment rate at that time? It was 4.4%. Just think about that for a minute. The vacancy rate now, when the unemployment rate is 11%, is the same as it was back uh, just a little over three years ago when the unemployment rate was 4.4%. If you go back to the uh, worst of the, um, uh, of the um, global financial crisis in the United States, when the unemployment rate peaked at 10%, the vacancy rate was only 1.6%. So this, this says that, and there's a variety of reasons for this, maybe we'll get into the, this in the Q of A, that have to do both with policy um, and perhaps also with measurement issues. Um, the, the US labor market is in some respects much stronger than it appears from the unemployment numbers. That doesn't mean it's a great labor market, but it's much stronger than it appears uh, from, the, uh, 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 from the unemployment numbers. So the, these are, the vacancy data are from the employer side. So you know, some people might be inclined to discount that. But workers, workers, data from the worker side say, tell the same story. So the conference board has for a long time been asking, uh, running a surveys where they ask workers, how hard is it to get a job? Okay, um, in their most recent survey, I think this is also a June or, or a July number. Um, looks like I didn't put it on the chart. 24% um, of respondents said jobs are hard to get. Well, when was the last time they said jobs were that hard to get? Back in 2015, when the unemployment rate was 5.3%, okay? Um, and this, the 24% is nothing like uh, how hard workers thought it was to get a job back in the uh, uh, 2008, 2009, even though the unemployment rate's higher now. So both the employer side and the worker side are telling us that the labor market isn't nearly as bad uh, as it looks. One more piece of good news on this front, and uh, I guess Peter's maybe going to talk about startups. So this may be directly relevant to what he's going to say, and I'm keen to get his uh, observations on that. In the immediate wake of the pandemic, um, this measure, and I'll tell you what the measure is in a second, um, of new business formation in the United States plummeted by you know, roughly 35, 40% um, relative to year ago values, but also relative to um, what these uh, new business formation uh, rate had been running at, at in the uh, early weeks of 2020. Um, but then more recently, uh, this measure uh, has actually risen above its pre-pandemic levels. And new business formation as measured this way is 60 to 100% greater now than it was a year earlier. So what is this measure? This is an administrative uh, record uh, count that comes from the Census Bureau. It's basically based on uh, fi filings for new taxpayer identification numbers and other information. Um, and what the Census Bureau has done here is taken the subset 
of these new tax, of these new filings for employer identification numbers that historically have led to uh, new employees, because not all employer identification numbers actually lead to hiring. Um, and, that, and so this is their judgment, okay? So I think this is a very interesting uh, good news story. These are not companies that have necessarily hired workers already, but that, that based on historical patterns, they expect to hire and they, they are likely to hire in the near future. So, so that's the good news. There are, there are jobs and potential jobs out there. Um, I'll come back to a, um, a sobering aspect of that uh, later, which is also related to something Jan said, the kinds of workers and jobs that are disappearing may be very, very different from where the new jobs are forming. Now, um, again, let me, let me just pause here briefly. I wanna stop and just think about, I've shown you an awful lot of data. I wanna stop and think about a little bit of economic reasoning before I go on. Um, there have been some tremendous behavioral shifts induced by the pandemic. Um, first, in the way that um, households acquire goods and services. And there's been this massive shift to online shopping and delivery. Um, I'm just going to assert, I'm not going to show you any evidence that much of that will stick because people have figured out how to purchase things online. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them will continue to value the convenience and perceived safety. Okay. Um, on the business side, and here I have some evidence that businesses have been forced and academics for that matter, have been forced to turn to virtual meetings out of necessity. And many of them find it's you know, easier, cheaper. Uh, as Jan said, this was the easiest flight to London she ever had. Uh, I feel the same way. Um, uh, so, you know, there are some advantages to doing things via Zoom. Uh, if, you ask, if you ask businesses, and we, we have asked them this in the survey of business uncertainty, uh, what do you expect your travel expenditure budget to look like after the pandemic is over compared to what it was before the pandemic? It's down 29%, okay? So at least now businesses are telling us they don't think they're going back to the, uh, the old uh, reliance on face-to-face uh, -face meetings. Now, on a, working from home, same thing. Um, and I'm gonna, here I am gonna show you quite a bit of the evidence and that's gonna be the focus of much of the rest of my remarks. Um, so why don't I just get into that? And, but I, I, as I go through the argument, as I go through the evidence, I want you to just take note of the evidence, but also think about what the evidence says about the likelihood that the behavioral shifts with respect to working arrangements will stick after the pandemic is over, okay? Because the theme I'm trying to draw out here is not just that there's been a big shift to working from home, but that we're not going back okay, to the way things were. Now, let me start out with what I think is my most compelling piece of evidence, cartoon evidence. So when you, when you, uh, and this, this, this picture captures uh, uh, in, in an amusing way, uh, two, two key points. First is the surprise nature of the COVID-19 pandemic. But second, I think it gives you this sense uh, that we, there's the wrecking ball. We aren't going back to where we were. So when it starts showing up in cartoons like this, you know, there may be some deeper uh, social forces at work. And I'm gonna show you some more systematic evidence that that is indeed the case. And here I'm, I will draw heavily on the survey business uncertainty, um, as well as some additional surveys of workers and households that Nick Bloom and Jose Maria Barrero and I are doing in follow-up work. Let me start with some evidence. And also I'm gonna draw uh, quite a bit on the American time use survey that many of you know, and which has long been used to study uh, time allocation. So in the bottom panel of this chart, we're relying on pre-pandemic data from the American time use survey. And here I'm, sh I'm showing you in the bottom row, um, kind of the distribution of full work days by full-time workers across different working arrangements. The 89.8% number is those who rarely or never work from home for pay, okay? And then the number who work from home one full day per week, 3.8%. If you aggregate it across those bins, um, what you find is that 
before the pandemic, according to the American Time Use Survey, um, paid working days at home were about 5% of all working days. Back in May, we asked businesses um, how many, you know, the same kinds of questions designed to parallel those in the American Time Use Survey uh, about their work, the, the fraction of their workers who worked from home before the pandemic. Okay, that's what you see in the top row. If you aggregate those entries, you get a very similar number, 5.5%. So the American Time Use Survey data asking households and the survey business uncertainty data asking employers give us very similar answers to the pre-pandemic situation. But in the survey business uncertainty, we also ask businesses to project forward and say, well, once the pandemic's over, what do you think you'll be doing? The bottom line there is that businesses as of May expect that their reliance on working from home for pay, full days working from home will roughly triple, okay? That was in May. If you asked them the same question again, I suspect the numbers would be somewhat higher. Now, what does that mean? That means you're taking about one-tenth of all workdays and shifting them from business premises to home. If you zero in on those who tend to work in offices, okay, which we do, but I'm not gonna show you here, the number is more like one-fifth, okay? So I'll repeat that. About one-fifth of all office worker days, according to our survey evidence, will shift away from business present premises to um, residences and coffee shops and so on. Okay, uh, I didn't have put it in the slide deck, but think about what that means for business districts. There's going to be a huge shift in worker activity and worker spending power away from business district districts where office workers tended to congregate. And that's true even if those office buildings continue to house office workers, but now in a more socially distanced way, there won't be as many workers coming to the office on a given day, and they won't be spending as much on restaurants, bars, convenience shops, um, and so on, entertainment venues right around the business districts. That is a, another aspect of this reallocative aspect, another reallocative aspect of the pandemic that I don't dwell on in my slides here, but is uh, very important to keep in mind when you think about the future of cities. Now, this is also from the survey business uncertainty, but there's now several surveys that kind of come down in a similar place. Um, and that is what was happening during the pandemic, during the worst of the lockdowns and the fear-induced social distancing. Um, half or more of all labor services were being supplied remotely at that time, okay? And if you do, th if, you can, if you compute an earnings weighted version of that, then in our survey, we found that two thirds all labor in May wage weight on earned wages were being supplied remotely. That's an astonishing number, but its importance in my present discussion is to just get you to. Steve, do you want to just turn? Uh, we can't hear you just at the moment. I think it's the connection at his end. Yeah, we've just lost the connection at your end. While while we get Steve back, can um, people ha have now have a perfect chance to think about some questions to ask him? So go to slido.com and you just need to use the code. Uh, of 51008. So go to slido.com 51008 to put in your questions. Steve has disappeared, but hopefully he will try and rejoin now. Yeah. We were we were getting close to uh fantastic Steve, you're back Steve again. Did, yeah. I'm back. I I don't know what happened. My zoomed out. Um let, let me, I, and I see I'm getting close to my end, so let me very quickly make a few points. That's how great it is to work at home. 
It's hungry. Yes. Yes. By the, I'll have one point directly on this, but so I just showed you the scale of this experiment. And Jan mentioned frictions being overcome. There are frictions at the individual level. We just saw one of them. There are frictions at the organization level and there are frictions at the network level. Okay. Getting other people to uh, coordinate. Here's evidence that workers have spent a lot of time and money learning how to do work from home. Okay. That's and, happened. And Steve, could you share your screen again, please? Thank you. There, Great, okay. thanks. Back on? Yep, perfect. This is, this is evidence that workers have invested a lot of time and money in learning how uh, to do work from home, okay? That's point one. The social stigma surrounding working from home, which used to be considerable, appears to have vanished. Maybe it'll return, but at least for the moment, it's vanished, okay? So there's been a big change in perceptions. That's kind of the social norm aspect of this. Workers have learned how efficient they are at home relative to businesses. Many, not all, but many workers have learned, and so have their employers, that they're at least as productive at home and sometimes more productive, okay? That's an important piece of information that says, you know, that you, there's something you learn from this massive social experiment and you will act on it after you learn it. By and large, and here I'm showing you evidence from household surveys, but the same shows up in business surveys. By and large, the experience working from home in terms of effectiveness and efficiency has turned out much better than most businesses and most workers expected. Doesn't mean it's turned out perfect. It's turned out much better. And that means we've learned something in this experiment that says, you know what, we don't want to go back to where we were, okay? Because um, we're, and then, well, we also, we also survey, well, what are, the, what are the key things that undermine work from home efficiency? Uh, there's two, two that stand out. One is bad internet connections. We just experienced that. And the other is living with young children. Those are the two killers of work from home productivity. Uh, and, and but, but for many people, um, they find that working from home is better. So we did this little experiment. If you, if you let everybody optimize on um, whether they work from home or not, and uh, if everybody's forced to work from home, there's an efficiency loss of about 4%. But if you let people re-optimize after using the information they've learned from this massive social experiment, there's a 3% productivity gain, okay? If you let them optimize on how they work. That's an, another thing that's means we're not gonna go um, back to where we were. Employees have very strong desires to work from home. Not everybody, but, but, but on average, more so than employers. So if employers want to shift more activity to home, there's gonna be a lot of willingness on the side of uh, workers. I'm gonna end on the last uh, point. Um, and this is another sobering aspect of this. While there's tremendous scope for working from home, for improving efficiency, um, all of the evidence we has, have very strongly indicates that the people, the kinds of workers, the kinds of jobs that are most able to, um, they're most suitable for working from home are the ones that have already been doing quite well, not just during COVID, but in recent decades. They're better educated people, they're professional people. The people at the, who are at the lower ends of the wage distribution were hammered by COVID, as Jan mentioned yesterday. Those people have jobs, uh, that are much less suitable for working from home. So this is reinforcing a point I made earlier that the pandemic is great news actually for many businesses and some workers, but it's very bad news for workers who've already been suffering um, um, negative adverse labor market developments in recent decades. And I, I'm gonna stop there. Thanks. Great, um, thank you very much. Okay, so um, let me just uh, 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 thank Steve for that um, whirlwind tour through a vast amount of data. I think we are now uh, very much um, in the picture in terms of uh, this, the, the extreme peculiarity of this episode and its effects on um, uh, as, as measured by these uncertainty measures, but then uh, the, the implications for labor reallocation and the big questions for policy. And I'm sure we'll come to those in the 
question and answer session. So let me turn um, to Peter, but before doing so, just remind you how to do the question and answers. So just go to the Slido, uh, slido.com. It's very easy, put in your event code and away you go. That's all you need to do. Um, it's good if you enter your name, but if you don't and you put in a question, that's also good. So uh, let's, um, let's switch over to, to Peter. Great, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to discuss this paper. So I'm gonna try to share my screen. Um, I've put only the, the first one on, um, but actually it was, uh, it was two papers. Uh, so I, I have to apologize to all the uh, courses that I missed. Um, so both of them, uh, both of these papers are, are fascinating. Uh, the, the amount of facts that are, are in there and, and the type of facts that are in there are, are really interesting. Um, but of course, uh, it's also kind of pretty scary um, what, what we're seeing right now. So just a very, very brief summary. Uh, lots of permanent job losses uh, predicted, uh, unprecedented rise in uncertainty uh, and a projected slow recovery, right? So that's really kind of, ingredients for, uh, for you know, tough times uh, to come. Uh, so let me uh, try to kind of step away from this uh, gloomy uh, message and just kind of like focus on, on say the academic uh, side of things. Um, so both of these papers are, you know, pose questions that are interesting in their own right, but I was wondering whether the scope to kind of more explicitly uh, connect these two. Right? What, what really is the interaction between uncertainty and reallocation? So if you think about it from kind of a, uh, you know, say established uh, theory point of view, uh, you, could, you could kind of think through the wait and see hypothesis of, of mix, uh, but then kind of the, the plain version of this would suggest that reallocation actually uh, kind of drops or freezes, you know, upon an increase in uncertainty. Um, there's, there's other ways you could think about how, why uncertainty can affect the, the real economy, uh, for instance, through financial frictions. Um, and the prediction here, I think, would kind of depend on maybe which firms uh, were hit the hardest and depending on what financial constraints they were facing. So potentially, uh, you could see an increase in uh, reallocation uh, kind of in face of this uh, rise in uncertainty. Um, but neither of them, neither of these two uh, that I picked uh, kind of seem to fit the, the current situation. So I was wondering whether there's something simple that uh, could be done uh, to just kind of have a look at what you know, access or reallocation in, in general does uh, or has done in the past uh, in response to uncertainty shocks. Uh, so presumably you could, you could kind of stick uh, a measure of access reallocation into the uh, VARs. And have a look at what you know whether uh, the current situation really is uh, unique in the sense that you know we haven't really seen you know, increases in reallocation following uncertainty shocks in the past, uh, or whether uh, you know this is just in, in quotation marks a really big shock. Uh, so I was kind of wondering um, how how new the situation really is that we're we're currently in. Related to this. Um, is, uh, I, I took this graph from the paper, it was a really uh, interesting measure of, of uh, reallocation. You can really see how, how it kind of goes up in, in a tremendous fashion uh, at the beginning of 2020. Um, I'm wondering whether you could try to decompose these changes into these three components, right? And maybe in kind of going back to the previous slide, maybe uh, understanding which of these three components, if any, is primarily driving uh, the increase in reallocation. Could tell us a little bit more about kind of the nature of shocks that are really uh, hitting the economy right now, and, and tell us a little bit more, or you know, we could try to understand a little bit more uh, about what the what the economy is uh, kind of facing right now. Now, I have a few other uh, kind of more sp specific uh, questions about uh, some of the parts of the analysis. Uh, one of the one of the questions I was uh, wondering about is whether the pandemic kind of caused this change in activity in a local sense, or did it kind of create an aggregate shock? So obviously we can kind of see that now it's a it's a global thing, 
but the way it was spreading is was really kind of through a staggered way uh, through certain hotspots, and, and gradually, of course, it kind of overtook uh, the U.S. and, and you know, uh, the entire world. Um, but I'm wondering whether you could kind of uh, maybe leverage some of this spatial variation and try to understand whether kind of the, the increase in reallocation, the decline in uh, say new business formation or applications, whether they were more local in a sense, or whether even the places that weren't currently hotspots could kind of see that you know this is going to be an aggregate bouncer and they started already reacting to that. So I had a quick look at this um, using the the BFS data. So I looked at the change in business applications at the state level, uh, and then I compared it uh, to uh, all COVID deaths or related deaths um, uh, from the CDC at the state level and looking at you know at the beginning of kind of the, the the pandemic really so these weeks 14 and 15 to the end of March beginning of April um, just kind of see what the relationship between these two is so from the heat map it's not terribly obvious but there is a you know a, a substantial correlation between these two but it also suggests that there's lots of other uh, factors that were in there. So taking it in, taking kind of at face value, it would suggest that, you know, it wasn't purely a local thing, but really kind of had lots of spillover effects also to areas that weren't necessarily currently experiencing the, the pandemic. Um, then this was kind of touched upon and, and uh, maybe it was also uh, yesterday, uh, kind of the effect, uh, the, the unequal effect this pandemic has had. So Abby Adams is here in Oxford, uh, and I, I saw uh, her research recently, and they have some absolutely fascinating survey evidence on working from home and, and how it has a different impact. Uh, so this is what, what uh, Steve touched upon at the very end. So what they're looking at here is the US, UK, and Germany, um, people kind of responding how much of their work they think they can do from home, or the left bars being the lowest and the, uh, the right bars being the highest fraction of their tasks that they can do from home. And then they kind of uh, relate it to the share of workers that actually lost their jobs. And you know, unsurprisingly, you can see uh, that there's this very strong correlation. Um, there's, a, there's another interesting inequality is that there seems to be a gender gap and a college premium in job losses. Uh, right? So if, if you have a university degree, you're less likely to lose a job. If you're female, you're more likely to lose a job. Um, once you control for this amount of tasks that you think you can do from a home, and the college premium disappears, um, but the gender gender kind of job loss gap is still there. Right? And this is conditional on occupations, industries, and a bunch of other stuff, which I kind of cut out from the table. So I think this is really interesting because it's something that you know we we don't really understand from the observables that we have, but it's also showing that this recession, you know, or you know, the current crisis is very different. Um, because typically it's the men that uh, kind of you know, suffer more job loss in, in recessions. So this again kind of shows that you know, we're, we're kind of fight, facing a, a very different situation than before. And then uh, last thing um, is Wendy already uh, uh, kind of hinted at. So I've done some uh, work with a friend of mine with Vincent uh, Sterk at UCL, uh, trying to understand uh, what Steve was talking about, about the long recovery. Uh, but what we're, what we're doing is really just kind of like a counting exercise, just using the facts that we know about startups and young firms um, and uh, kind of playing around with certain scenarios of what's going to happen. We're trying to understand how long this recovery could take. So what we, what we do is um, we, can, we vary three margins. So essentially the number of startups, um, the exit rates of young firms and the growth potential of startups. And then uh, in this calculator, and as Wendy said, you, could, you can have a look at that on the website, you can play around with the different scenarios. So this is just a snapshot. So here you can change the three margins. Right? So you put in how much you think the crisis will impact startups, growth potential, and survival rates, how long it will take. Uh, so in this case, we're kind of trying, well, what if it lasts for one year and it's roughly the magnitude of the financial crisis? And this is the impact on aggregate employment. Right? So the message is that, you know, just from a purely accounting point of view, uh, you would predict that, you know, the recovery is not going to happen for, you know, essentially a decade. And there's going to be about 10 million uh, jobs lost. Now, Steve kind of 
uh, show this already, uh, you know, it might not be so bad because the recovery in, in uh, at least business applications seems to be incredibly strong. Um, right, so there's, there's even uh, these uh, likely non-employers have never grown so fast. And even the likely employer applications have actually rebounded quite strongly uh, and, and are higher than they were in the, um, you know, since the Great Recession, essentially. And, you know, you can put this into the calculator as well and try to see what uh, a scenario with a bounce back uh, would look like. So that, that's about uh, what I have. There's a bunch of uh, little things that I was curious about, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. Uh, there's one other thing that uh, I just thought about. Um, there's this beautiful paper on the permanent effects of forced experimentation um, by, again, two of my uh, colleagues here, Tim Willems and uh, Ferdinand Rauch. Um, they had this forced experiment of the London tube shutting down, and they found out that lots of people actually then stuck to their alternative routes that they were forced to take. Um, so I, I thought I suddenly thought of that as a as an analog to what might happen with uh, all the different things that we're experiencing right now. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. That I think we got uh, what we hoped for, which was a set of really fascinating reflections as well as questions. Um, so this, the, uh, the torch is handed back to you, Steve, uh, to respond to Peter, and then we'll go to uh, the general Q&A. Uh, Pete. Peter, thanks for those uh, thanks for those comments. Lots of great stuff there. Um, I loved your forced experiment. I haven't seen that paper, but I'll definitely take a look. Um, I'm gonna kind of work backwards from some of the things you talked about. Um, the rise in new business applications is is hopeful and maybe a bit surprising. Um, let me try to say a couple things about that. There, there was also, in, at least in the United States, a huge drop off in both. Um, new business formation, but also the growth of existing young businesses in the wake of the housing bust and financial crisis. Um, and, and John Haltwinger and I have a paper on that. There are two things about this crisis in that respect that are actually better than then. First, we have not had a housing market collapse and equity, home equity financing or just the wealth in your home and what it says about your risk tolerance seems to be quite important for new business formation um, and, and the willingness to expand existing young businesses in the United States. So that's one reason why at least there's some hope that uh, young business activity won't um, dry up as much this time as it did uh, after 08, 08, 09. The other reason is, is you know, we didn't have a financial crisis in the banking sector in the same way. And so there's, there is a greater willingness to lend. Um, there is, uh, huge efforts made by the central bank, uh, certainly, uh, and uh, the fiscal authorities in the United States to make financing available. Now, there are other impediments. I, I, I share Peter's view that providing a path for young businesses to get started and to grow and to hire workers is, is extremely important. And it's actually, it's more important than their contribution to GDP in the following sense. Younger businesses, smaller businesses as well in general, um, tend to disproportionately hire less educated and younger workers. And so their, con their kind of contribution to um, society in terms of providing employment opportunities is greater than their contribution to GDP. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to, uh, to keep in mind. There are regulatory barriers. I won't get into them. That I, only, I really only know the landscape in the U.S. here, but there are certainly things that can be done to facilitate uh, business licensing, business formation, occupational entry by workers, and so on. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done to make it easier uh, for new businesses to get on track and to grow. So um, uh, definitely very sympathetic to that that line uh, of thinking. And I think it's um, something policymakers haven't, haven't given enough attention to, at least in the United States. The Adams paper, which I've not seen before, sounds very interesting. The results that you described about how work, working from home cuts uh, against different demographic groups is very much in line with what we see uh, in the United States in, the, in this uh, work in progress that, with Nick Bloom and Jose Maria Barrero that, uh, that I referenced. Uh, papers titled something like The Future of Working from Home. We do have slides, but no draft yet. Um, you know, in terms of um, 
reallocation? How unusual is this shock? What you ask for in terms of the EARs is a little reminiscent of stuff that Haldaway and I did with uh, uh, way back in the early 90s. Um, you know, it's as usual, it's a little hard to tease things out of VARs. But if you think back and ask yourself, at least I've asked myself this question, when was the last time we had a big reallocation episode like, like this? <clears throat> at least qualitatively, because I don't think we've ever had in the post-war period something of this magnitude. But when, when, when have we had a reallocation episode that wasn't driven so much by a financial crisis, but by something else? And I think the only close analog that comes to my mind is the 70, 73, 74 oil price shock uh, in the United States and around the world, which, which involved a huge persistent shift in the relative price of fuels. Um, and that did generate a lot of reallocation activity. Um, and it informs my thinking about the current situation because one of the things that came out of that episode is the destruction side of the response to the reallocation response happened pretty quickly. Within, within half a year. The creation side took longer. It took a couple of years. And that's the challenge that Peter also highlighted. Um, yeah, we can have reallocation, but if the destruction, if the creation response to the destruction side of reallocation lags, then we're going to be in for a very long, slow, miserable recovery. And that, that to me is the key challenge that, that policymakers uh, uh, should seek to avoid. I'll stop here. Perfect. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Okay, so there's a good load of questions coming on um, on the Slido, but we need definitely there's uh, opportunity for more. So um, just log on to slido.com and with the number 51008 and you can join in. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Amit now to, uh, to work through the questions. Thanks, Wendy. So uh, you're right, we've had uh, se several questions. What I've tried to do is um, sort of group them um, into something uh, that might be uh, slightly, you know, just, just to give the speaker a bit more uh, coherence. So um, let me start with, um, so, so, so Steve, you, you, you sort of started by, um, by placing this, this COVID um, pandemic in, in kind of a historical perspective. Um, and you compared it with the sort of Spanish flu and, um, and, and the 50s epidemic. Um, and the question that sort of came in was, was kind of related to, uh, to, to the trigger for, for the disruption, which, which I suppose is the lockdown more than, uh, more than anything else. Uh, and the question was, you know, well, uh, they, they, we didn't really have a lockdown in the, in, in, in the, in the Spanish uh, flu or, or, or 1950s. Uh, and in that sense, you know, that's that's why this this particular episode is so different. Uh, but I was, I mean, so so you know, maybe you want to say something about that. But I was wondering whether you you might also um, have something to share about the different experiences across the states in in the different states in the United States. Um, you know, the, has has the lockdown been materially different um, in in each of these states, and have 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 some of the behaviors and responses. Uh, been different as a result of that. I mean, we can see that to some extent on a sort of cross-country cross basis. So, you know, countries like maybe South Korea, where, where they've managed this better because of their previous experience with, with epidemics had a, had a different response. So I was just wondering, you know, whether you want to sort of bring in the, the yeah. specific so, lockdown experience. Yeah, so there's, there's, a lot, there's, there's a lot wrapped up in what you said. I think there's at least three parts. So let me start with the reference to South Korea. I think there, there are a handful of countries, South Korea, Taiwan, that had the capacity and executed a uh, testing, contact tracing, some version of quarantining or closed or confinement of people who were uh, diagnosed with the COVID. And they rolled it out quickly and kept the virus much more under control. Um, most countries have not done that. They, they may have tried, but they didn't have the capacity or they tried and they failed to execute on that. Uh, certainly the United States and the UK are in that category, but so are most countries. Um, so I think once you step away from that small handful of countries um, that executed that type of strategy, um, what I, what my reading of the evidence, both across countries, but also across states within the United States, 
is yes, there's a role for lockdown uh, policies, but there's also a very considerable role, probably even more important role for voluntary social distancing efforts um, by employers, by households. Okay, so it's certainly, it's certainly not just the story of government locks down, that, that's why the economy shut down and so on. Um, you can see that I think in the data on, on the Google mobility type data, but you can also, there's also another point I wanted to make, which is, it's relevant to one of the things I think Peter asked me. Um, I have another paper in the works, which not yet circulated, but it's gonna be in an IMF conference in November. So it's gotta get the circulation soon, in which we find the, we show the following. Um, if you look at countries around the world, and we have about 30 countries in our sample. There's a very, very distinct pattern that equity markets collapse in the country. Um, about a week to 10 days before um, workplace mobility collapses. Um, that's quite striking in that, it's, and, and that it says there's something going on in the financial market, certainly, that precedes the lockdowns in most cases, and that even precedes their voluntary social distancing responses. Um, now, so that, that's about uh, within the states. Now, at the outset of your question, you, you, you raise what I think is a huge question that economists have largely ignored. And I don't fully understand why. The, the response both by policymakers and individual agents acting of their own will is just so completely different than what we saw in previous pandemics relative to the scale of the risk. There's an enormous open question. Why have we behaved so differently, both at the policymaker level, but also in terms of um, individual human beings making their decision, individual businesses? Neil Ferguson, a historian at the Hoover Institution, has, has raised this issue in a pointed way. Um, I have, in some of my writings, like the uncertainty paper that we talked about, and also this asset pricing paper on the unprecedented stock market impact. We try to draw attention to that contrast without really offering an answer. But I think there's a fascinating, so I'll just, one hypothesis is that people in 1918 and 1957, they were used to dealing with infectious diseases that had fatal and tremendously harmful consequences at scale all the time. Polio was still you know, around and very much fresh in the memories of people in 57, 58. Many people in 57 had lived through the Spanish flu. You know, people who, who in the Spanish flu, they'd lived through World War I um, and co frequent cholera outbreaks and so on. So there's, a, there's a, a social question here of, have we become much more sensitive to these kind of mortality risks because we haven't had anything like it, at least in the rich countries. Uh, for decades. I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's a profoundly important question and economists ought to get involved in trying to answer that question. It extends well beyond economics, but uh, I don't really understand why we seem to jump, we've jumped on this bag, what, bandwagon as a profession that we've got to clamp down. Maybe that's the right response, but if you're really going to argue we've got to clamp down in a big way through mandatory and voluntary uh, efforts, why didn't we do that in the past? You know, were we wrong in the past and we're right now? There's just huge unanswered questions here. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So um, sort of the second set of questions, uh, I guess, relate to the labor market. So I suppose the, the one that's uh, immediately sort of worth highlighting is um, at the EEA lecture, Alan Manning showed increasing effects of monopsony in the UK labor markets. Could you tell us possibly of monopsony in the, in the US labor markets? And so that's, that's one question, but I think there were other questions around the labor markets, some of which I think you've, you have already answered or, or touched upon, you know, the impact of unskilled workers and, 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 um, and, and, and young workers. Uh, but I, maybe, maybe the, the one on the monopsony. So let me, yeah, let me take, let me talk about monopsony and I'm, I'm going to give a um, focused an, an answer that's focused in one direction. Um, there are definitely instances of monopsony power. Um, 
the point I want to make is they're often induced by regulation. Okay, uh, in the United States, we have uh, occupational licensing is a big deal. It operates particularly on the lower and middle low end of the uh, wage distribution. Occupational licensing is in many respects uh, an incumbent protection device uh, that uh, the only way you can kind of get into an occupation like hairstyling, for example, is to serve as an apprentice uh, for somebody who's already in the business, usually a more senior hairstylist, and work for them for a pittance for, for a long time. Uh, in the United States, as it, as it operates, occupational licensing also inhibits uh, geographic mobility um, because it's, it's typically done at the state level. And often these occupational licensing requirements are not reciprocal across state boundaries. So it, it geographically segments markets as well, which is another force for monopsony. So occupational licensing is one regulatory aspect of the environment of the United States that contributes to monopsony power, okay? Another one, and I'll stick, you know, comes to mind because of COVID, uh, we have something called certificate of need um, regulations in the United States. Again, they operate at the state level. They vary across states. Most states have them, not all. Um, a certificate of need regulation works as follows. If you wanna introduce a new hospital, a new medical clinic, if you wanna expand the number of beds in your hospital, if you even wanna reallocate, in some cases, your beds from one kind of use to another kind of use, if you wanna open a hospice, if you wanna, in some jurisdictions, have new diagnostic equipment, you've got to demonstrate need. Now, what, is, what does that mean? That means you go, you go before a board in which you have to um, show, not that you're competent, not that you're highly skilled, highly qualified to provide these services, um, but that there's a need. Now, who, gets to who else gets to testify at these hearings? Your rivals, your local rivals. Okay, so um, what that does is it deters, and there's, there's quite a bit of evidence on this that in states that have certificate of need laws, con laws as they're often abbreviated, you have fewer hospital beds per capita. Um, you have fewer hospices per capita. Um, you have less emergency, less availability of emergency ambulance services. It takes you longer to get to hospitals when you, or some medical clinic when you need service. So these things actually deter entry. Now, deterring entry adds to market power and, and part of the market power shows up in the labor market. So this may not be the biggest source of monopsony power, but the larger picture I'm trying to paint, and it gets back to uh, regulatory restrictions on reallocated activity, as long as you have regulatory barriers that impede the entry of new businesses and the expansion of existing businesses horizontally, you make it easier for employers to exercise monopsony power. Uh, that's, the, that's the main point I wanna make. And I think it's a little off the usual uh, arguments people make about monopsony power. And I'm not disputing those. I'm just saying that to recognize there are many features of the policy landscape that create the conditions for employers to exercise monopsony power. Uh, there may be intrinsic aspects of the market itself that we need to address, but to start with, let's at least not make the problem worse by the kinds of regulatory policies we adopt. Right. So, so I suppose, um, I mean, there's another set of questions related to, to policy, and I think you, you've already uh, touched on one of these sort of impediments to, to, um, to, to sort of new, uh, creation of new companies. And I suppose the, quest the questions were kind of were more specific about what kind of policies um, might be helpful to uh, help the transition um, that you talked about, the new sort of working uh, environment which uh, also includes um, a greater propensity to work from home. Um, so are there any sort of specific policies that can help uh, lift productivity or, um, or, or sort of enhance the sort of working from home experience? And I think related to that, there was also a question about, well, there will be uh, services uh, that will be required for people from, you know, to work from home. Um, and would that not act as a sort of offset to, to, the, to the losses in, in jobs and opportunities in, in city centers? Yeah, to, uh, good. All, the, all these are great questions, by the way, um, every one of them. So is this one. So let me, a few things. First, um, 
on you know on the on the work from home there's we experienced this earlier there the, the infrastructure that delivers internet services is kind of a local public good so obviously this is a local issue but there's there's a very important role for the local authorities that are responsible for uh, making sure we have good internet services and that's kind of a their private and public parties engaged in that. So providing high quality internet service, that, that's a key, uh, that's, that, that comes out very clearly uh, in our survey evidence. That's one of the key determinants of whether you can work from home effectively. And that one is definitely uh, something that can be influenced by policy operating at the local level. So high quality internet connections, uh, that, that's kind of an obvious policy thing. We touched upon one policy issue earlier that's quite important for the reallocation as it involves young businesses. And that's to make sure that financing for viable businesses is available. And by and large, I think we've, we've seen in the United States and many other countries have done a reasonably good job of that. Uh, but it doesn't mean we're done. We have to make sure that going forward, uh, we continue to provide um, good financing opportunities for businesses. And maybe in, in the United States and many other advanced countries, we can do more to um, provide better equity financing offers. You know, it's very expensive to go public in most countries. So we need, we need equity financing options, uh, crowdsourcing, whatever. I don't really study the details of the regulations in this area, but it's another area where the regulatory environment kind of can either inhibit and make costly uh, kind of small scale equity finance or facilitate it. And the facilitating part will help on the, on the young business uh, growth and formation. So that's another key area. Now, uh, to the issue about reallocation, do we need more services? Yes, we certainly do. There is, there, that's the plus side. There, this reallocation brings lots of opportunities, but those opportunities take time to materialize. And part of, what, part of the reason why it takes time to materialize is businesses need to plan, they need to invest, uh, they need to execute on their investment plans. But part of what also influences how long it takes to execute the creation side of the reallocation process is again, back to the regulatory environment. And much of this is not the sexy kind of macroeconomic policy that we often talk about. It's really ground level details about how efficient is the local business licensing uh, and zoning and land use um, process. Is it something that, does it take years to repurpose? a commercial building in a downtown business district from an old use to a new use? Or is it something that can be done in um, a couple of months? Well, there's a big difference between the two months and the two years in terms of bringing new jobs online and all of the auxiliary jobs that, that, that come with that. There's a piece of property in downtown Chicago that now houses less than a kilometer from where I live, now houses um, a um, high-end um, retail, it's about, seven or eight stories, high-end retail restaurants, movie theater, that kind of thing. That's like right square in the center of downtown Chicago. That, that's a whole city block. It sat vacant for about 20 years, tied up in regulatory and legal disputes. It's not that the land wasn't valuable, that nobody wanted to develop it. So if, we, if that's what happens when we try to restructure urban cores and cities that are affected by uh, a shift to work from home, it's going to be a very painful transition process. Uh, we want to make sure we don't go down that path. Okay, so uh, thank you. So there's there's a question about uh, consumers. So um, the experience for the last few months has been that consumers have been forced to save. Um, there's just not been any supply of, of stuff that they wanted to buy. Um, and there's, there is evidence that this habit um, in, 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 you know, that consumers behave habitually. So is there any evidence to suggest that, you know, this experience is going to change um, our consumer behavior or, or, or maybe even the saving ratio per se? Let me take them in two pieces. Um, on the savings ratio, I do, I do think that people will remain worried about another infectious disease outbreak long after this one is resolved, um, just because this one will be fresh in their minds. 
uh, I don't know this literature terribly well, but my understanding of the literature is that people who lived through the depression, the Great Depression, were for the rest of their lives more financial, more frugal in their spending behavior than observationally similar people who didn't experience firsthand the Great Depression. Um, so we'll probably see some of that. There'll probably be a persistently higher savings ratio as a consequence of that. I think you were also asking about uh, consumer spending patterns um, as well. You know, here I'm aware of less solid evidence, but I thoroughly agree with the, the broader premise that there is a lot of habit formation um, in consumer spending behavior and in human behavior in general. Um, and part of that's beyond habits, we learn things. In my household, uh, we went four months without ever setting foot in a grocery store or any other retail outlet. Literally everything we bought, everything we acquired was online and delivered. So, well, you learn things, or my wife learns things, she handles it. You learn things about how to, you know, where to shop, how to make it more expeditious, how to arrange the delivery service. Not only that, there's all these complimentary investments made in these online shopping platforms, in these delivery uh, networks. I didn't have time to talk about it in my remarks, but there's anecdotal evidence that companies like Amazon and Walmart and Kroger are, well, they were already making big investments in online shopping platforms, obviously, and, and better delivery networks, but they greatly ramped up their investments. That means the online shopping experience and delivery experience for many people will continue to get better. And as it gets better, we'll, we'll tend to substitute away from uh, traditional shopping towards these new, uh, new shopping modes. Another point along these lines, more about the work from home, but it's again to understand the, the uh, reinforcing nature of these shifts uh, on the consumer side, the worker side, and the business side. You know, Facebook made some prominent announcements that as a consequence of what's happened during the pandemic, they are going to make a major um, further push to improve tools um, for remote interactivity. Now, they are doing that in part to facilitate their own working from home uh, arrangements. But obviously, if companies like Facebook develop new tools that improve the quality of remote interactivity, given their track record, given their global penetration, that's going to make remote interactivity look more attractive around the world for households and businesses. So I think we have to understand that, that while there are some forces with respect to spending, business travel, um, and um, work, work from home arrangements, that will lead to a bounce back once we resolve the pandemic. There are other forces that have already been put in place that involve the improvements of technologies, the developments of networks, and the way those things complement each other and complement consumer behavior that are gonna continue driving forward with even more force and at a greater speed because the pandemic happened, okay? And this is why I keep driving home this point um, that these pandemic induced shifts, we shouldn't expect them to fully reverse. And, and we should expect lots of reallocation activity in the immediate wake of the pandemic, in the medium term wake, but even over the next several years. Uh, so I keep coming back to this theme. We need to facilitate this reallocation process in a way that works for our economy, in a way that uh, is inclusive, that provides decent job opportunities for, uh, uh, for the workers who've been particularly hard hit. Steve, I have one, one final question. Um, so this one uh, relates to uh, the behavior of, of firms. And in particular, the question is about supply chains. Um, is, 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 it, is there any evidence to suggest that firms are gonna trade off efficiency uh, for resilience? Uh, I suppose maybe you can even talk in the context of uh, how they might um, handle their own balance sheets. Are they going to hold more cash? Are they, are they going to create more resilience through their balance sheets and supply chains, I suppose is the question, yeah. Yeah, I think we, all, I think we already saw some evidence um, before the pandemic struck 
of multinational firms trying to increase the resilience of their uh, supply chains in response to the trade tensions, um, particularly between the United States and China, but more generally the, 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 the shift towards a more hostile stance towards, uh, towards uh, trading goods and services, much, much of it unfortunately emanating from the United States, but not, but not, in, not exclusively from the United States. And companies were starting to reason, look, we, we, we need more resilience and you can achieve more resilience by bringing some production back home. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is just to diversify your foreign sources of critical inputs so that if the United States, for example, is on the outs with one country, you still have another source of supply. Um, so some of that was already happening. Um, and I think the pandemic will reinforce, um, will reinforce that on the part of companies. At the policy level, it's, it's pretty clear that there's some additional thinking uh, about creating gr greater resilience um, in supply chains for medical uh, equipment um, and um, and pharmaceuticals. You know that that may or may not turn out to be a big deal. I'm not sure. Uh, that seems like in many respects a problem that could be solved with strategic stockpiles. Um, might not require major shifts in supply chains. So there there has been uh, I think some of that already and. Look, if you think about how just-in-time inventory systems and the like work, they're great when there's no major shocks that disrupt, that disrupt some aspect of the supply chain, but it looks increasingly like we are living in a riskier world, riskier in the trade policy sense, riskier in the sense that um, infectious disease outbreaks, you know, we've kind of forgotten about them. This is a big reminder they're still around and probably also riskier in the geopolitical sense um, even though it might seem remote, and it probably is remote, the possibility that uh, military conflict could break out in a serious way uh, seems to be higher now than it was a few years ago. All three of those big shifts say the optimal thing to do is to build more resilience into your supply chain. That's partly about bringing production home. It's partly about geographically diversifying uh, uh, your, your, support, your critical inputs. So I do think we'll see more move in that direction and does it, it does come at a cost. You know, the, the resilience is not free. You have to pay for it. And you pay for it by higher, higher average production costs and higher, lower average productivity and higher costs for goods and services. And at that, um, on that cheerful note, um, we've come to the end of, uh, of our time. So uh, thanks again to Steve and to Peter. I think it really has been a great session. We've all got very long reading lists to go away with. Um, and just to remind everyone that uh, there's another session of the conference um, taking place at the same time uh, tomorrow. So thanks very much for, for being here and for Thank asking you. such great questions.